Now we are getting on to the second chapter of the CIA Part 3, and quite frankly, an extremely fun one for me, which is information security. You're, go you're going to learn about the different controls related to physical and information security, and also about data protection and data privacy. You're going to understand about different emerging cyber and technological risks as well. But first, let's start on this by understanding the definition of information security. Information security is the practice of protecting information by mitigating information risks. Okay, I think this is the shortest definition that, uh, that I could find, is the practice of protecting information, okay, by mitigating the different risks to that information. It's very short, but it's, it's still kind of vague. So I'm going to, you know, give a second definition, which gives a lot more details about this. It typically involves preventing or reducing the probability of unauthorized, inappropriate, and here I fall on a full list of things, but I've decided to, you know, highlight every single one because every single one is important in a different way. So, okay, we're preventing or reducing the probability of unauthorized or inappropriate access to data. Information security will aim to allow access to the people who should be allowed access to data and block access to those who should not, obviously, have access to the data. Unlawful use. Now, you have to understand that unlawful use can also be internal, and, and that's kind of an important part. If you have people from the wrong department in your organization having access to the wrong part, say your accountant who also has access to your bank accounts, then they could simply you know, make a transaction through your bank accounts and then hide it in the accounting. And so unlawful use is also problematic. Disclosure, inappropriate disclosure. That means, for instance, you know, showing confidential information to the company to others. Here we're, we're, we're thinking about things like you know, industrial espionage or honestly simply doing things that you know, would give a, a bad image to the company. Disruption. Here we're getting onto a kind of, you know, cyber vandalism. We're getting into denial of service attacks. These are attacks meant to block a, in, uh, a, a website or a web-based service from actually being able to, you know, function properly through denial of service attacks. Deletion. Indeed, this is, you know, I, I would say mostly for vandalism as well. Someone, say a disgruntled employee, deleting data could be extremely problematic. You know, maybe they spent years creating something, but then they got in a fight with their boss. They were unhappy about the situation, and so they simply decided to delete what they had previously created. Corruption. So here we're not talking about the financial kind, we're talking about corrupting information, such as, you know, same thing, a disgruntled employee, but in this case they're not deleting the information, they're encrypting it. Modification, modifying data in a certain way. There was an early case of uh, information security, uh, you know, cyber bullying, in the case of, you know, a high school student gaining access to their high school website and then putting, you know, mean comments about the teachers. That's, that's an old example of uh, one of the first uh, security breaches. And of course they had, uh, you know, the FBI, the NSA, this was in the U.S., you know, uh, bust into the house of this teenager who, you know, didn't understand this was a big crime. Huh? Uh, inspection. So indeed this would be, you know, allowing access to view certain potentially confidential information. I know of a case, and I'm not telling you where, of an employee who viewed the CEO's salary, and when it was discovered, this was no longer an employee. Let me just put it like this. And indeed, this would be a case of, you know, 
inspecting information which you know should not have been inspected. Recording information is is a bit similar to this. Uh, organizations, you know, especially um, let me put it unethical ones, might not want uh, some of their you know dealings being fully shown. Or devaluation of information. It can be, you know, a vandalism thing as well by a competitor, by a, um, a government actor. It can be different ways of, you know, deteriorating information so that it can no longer be used or loses its value. Let's look at some more precise definitions. Here we're looking at the definition of confidentiality. Confidentiality is allowing access only to permitted individuals. Okay, I think this is simple enough. You are blocking unauthorized access to certain information. Data integrity is the overall completeness, accuracy, and consistency of data. So much of the work you know, verifying data integrity will be error checking. Error checking first to verify, you know, the completeness of the data, whether it is correct and whether it is consistent, such as, you know, two different classification systems for the same thing, or maybe, you know, numerical listings, numerical listings, which skip numbers, and that could give a consistency problem. Data availability, so okay, no internet, right? Is whether data can be accessed and used in a timely and reliable manner. And you might think that, you know, this, this is only about, say, a website. The most common problem about data availability that I've seen in organizations that are spread out through the world and this is actually one of the most common type of, uh, you know, so-called, uh, you know, information uh, security incidents is simply about the availability of access to, you know, common applications. Especially the case that I've seen the most often is applications hosted in a headquarters, which would not be available or otherwise extremely slow to different say, you know, far off offices, a, a centralized database in Europe might not be quick or might not be accessible, say, to a team in Singapore when indeed this information needs to, you know, be, be accessible. And in this case, what is actually possible occasionally is having local mirrors of the data. So if there are, say, you know, uh, intranet problems communicating within the organization, then a local copy can work for a certain amount of time. We're now looking at IT general controls. This is actually a type of control that internal auditors look a lot at. And in fact, I'd like to say that it's probably the type of control that, say, an accountant or a finance team or even an external auditor might care the most about as well. Because IT general controls are controls that apply to all systems, components, processes, and data for a given organization or IT environment. I think it's still a little bit vague, but we're going to get to some examples. Common ITGC, so internal uh, IT general controls, include strategy, organization, and management of the IT function. External auditors, especially, might request a certain formality, and internal auditors do as well, I might say, a certain formality of IT procedures. Why? Because this allows consistency. This gives a kind of base mark for what you should have as IT controls in an organization and allows testing against these. It also allows the different operational teams to work towards meeting the goals of the, the different strategy, organization, and management you know, policies and procedures within within an IT function. 
operations and quality assurance procedures. Now, of course, you're thinking about internal auditors giving assurance, and indeed that is part of it. Other parts is indeed parts of the IT function, or indeed more independently a CISO. So remember, a CISO is not usually part of an IT function, at least in best practice. A, a chief information security officer would be independent from the IT so that it doesn't get pressure from IT and would be able to give assurance directly on information security. And so operations and quality assurance procedure should include, for instance, you know, ha having a CISO starting from a certain size of organization and someone being able to you know, have an overview, an independent overview of, of the different you know, IT systems, IT security controls in place. Business continuity planning, BCP, and disaster recovery planning. There are documents, sure, you might have heard about a BCP DRP. There are often documents kind of showing different things, different actions to take given disruptions in a system. So let's think about this for a second. Of course, it is not just a document. It is kind of a structure around a company where given an incident, an event, which disrupts your normal business operations, you have a governance structure where immediately you can call on you know, uh, important people in the organization to decide what to do. I've been part of those uh, tests as an internal auditor. I've audited this as well. You would have you know, a different test. Now, I've simulated these tests. I've seen these tests for real that you know, when an incident is detected, then the whole management team or at least the, the critical management team and the IT team are called into action to actually you know, be able to do something. A case of this was, well, it was simply a, a gas breach in the neighborhood of our building, which might have affected access to our server room. Okay, so that was actually big enough to, you know, block employees from entering the building and, uh, you know, uh, trying to figure out alternative ways of uh, routing our, our, our uh, IT communications. Another one that I, I gave would be, you know, disruptions to communication to, you know, say whole countries, that, that might mean that, you know, whole countries might not be able to work because communications with them might have been blocked. And so you, you'd have for different levels of emergencies, you know, different ways of responding from your BCP DRP plans. Those were in green, you know, the more, well, let me call it governance pol policies, procedures, you know, the, the different approaches that, you know, maybe ISO 27001, which cares a lot about, you know, policies, procedures, governance, would really emphasize on. Here we're, we're getting a bit into the more technical parts with backup and restoration. And so this is a common ITGC control. Depending on the organization, you might have between real-time backups or daily backups. It's very important that these backups are tested. That's to say that you know, there have been many cases of organizations that have kept continuous backups, but without proper testing, didn't know that you would have incompatible formats or that the backups just didn't work. So it's very, very important to be able to test your backups. Also, if you have you know, non-real-time backups, or even if you do, maybe you need a backup from you know, three days ago because if you had the backup from, you know, the, the, the last three days, those were corrupted by, uh, say, a cyber attack. You don't know where the malware might have been installed. So you might, have, you might need a backup from three days ago, or one week ago, or one month ago. And so you have a whole thing about, you know, rolling backups. When do you actually decide to, you know, get rid of a backup? You might only keep one backup per month, say. Systems development and change controls. You have to understand that changes to a system have to be properly approved. You have to have proper approval to a system because otherwise, say, you know, a, a developer 
wants to you know put in their own little feature potentially a fraudulent uh, you know little change to an application say a backdoor so it could access the system without uh, you know without a password and username later on well changes have to be approved and then verified after that and you have a whole thing about you know uh, change control and systems development uh, which is, you know, honestly beyond the scope of the CIA Part 3, but it's kind of good to know about at an awareness level. Systems programming and technical support, so it means that you have technical teams who are able to respond to ongoing issues, and programmers, because one of the issues that I've uh, frequently seen in, in teams, you know, even the ones with their programmers, is that home-made applications without proper programmers in-house might have been made by a third-party you know, company who will then charge either exorbitant amounts to be able to you know, give ongoing service to the application they gave, or you know, I've, I've seen the case of simply you know, IT, small IT companies you know, going belly up, being bought up, no, no longer doing a service, and then you not being able to you know, have the IT staff in-house uh, with the knowledge, that's the important part, to actually remedy, you know, problems. Physical security and access controls. I'm going to be very brief about this because we're going to see them very soon. Uh, logical access management, same thing. And protective and detective controls against threats. So, you know, detective controls means that you detect a threat. We're going to see some examples of that. Protective ones are, are things like firewalls that, you know, block against potential threats. Now we're going to look at the segregation of duties within IT teams, and in fact, a bit larger than IT teams. Huh? Segregation of duties minimizes errors and fraud by ensuring that no employee can both perpetrate and conceal errors or fraud. Basically what this means is that a same person should not be able to do multiple functions that are in conflict with each other. Let's look at a few examples of this. So, IT tasks which should be segregated include access to assets as well as changing records related to assets. This is a case that I've seen where those who would have access to laptops, screens, you know, uh, other IT equipment, would also be the ones writing it down in the system. Well, what's the problem with that? It's that, you know, if, if they want to, you know, have an extra laptop for themselves, all they have to do is say that it was, you know, uh, lent to so-and-so employee, and, um, you know, then you know, change the record in the system to say that, you know, it, it was lent out. Or even worse, that, you know, this laptop was damaged and thus should be, you know, written off, but in fact it's simply in the guy's suitcase. So there should be a segregation of duties between access to assets and being able to change records related to ac uh, assets. I'm going to give you a much, much higher profile example of this. It's about Jérôme Kerviel, who at the Société Générale perpetrated a massive fraud. He had access to the assets, that is to say he was kind of a trader, a, you know, asset manager, but indeed, you know, was able to, you know, control the asset side, but he had previously worked in more the controlling back office or middle office parts of the Société Générale Bank. He was able to access the assets on one side, and on the other side, you know, in his new role, he shouldn't have been able to do this, but what he did was change the records to, to you know, make it less visible and, uh, you know, be accepted by the systems. And so this is a very, very high-profile case where I, I, I believe the Société Générale lost, you know, a, a large part of its assets due to this, you know, fraudulent act. Indeed, uh, you know, if, if uh, th th this is probably, you know, one of the highest profile cases you can have, but if you want to have, uh, 
if you want to learn more, look at, say, the, the, the Bering Bank Institute, which is a pretty old example, where the Bering's Bank indeed, you know, actually went bankrupt due to a so-called rogue trader. Systems development and access to production data. Think about this, why this would be problematic. So systems developers, you know, programmers uh, and, and others uh, within that team are able to change things in a computer program. But access to production data, think of it. If same thing, you're in, you know, it, it can be a financial sector, but it can be a lot of different sectors. If you have valuable production data, then and if someone has also able to access as a systems developer, then they might be able to create a way, say a backdoor entrance, so that the data from the production data can be taken away. That's also a problem, especially with updates, once there is already production data. It's even more problematic if you're dealing with you know, third-party entities you know, say third party programmers who might have, you know, malicious intent. If they can have access to production data and also be able to, you know, change the programming, then they would, you know, have access to the valuable information in that production data. Finally, input and processing and authorization and validation. So, okay. As internal auditors, we understand this one. If you are inputting, let me just put the simplest example, an accounting entry, you're usually not the one validating it. If you're inputting payment instructions, you are not the one validating that the payments can go through. Which of the following access setups is appropriate in a computer environment? So let's, let's go through these, okay? So users have update access for production data. Okay, so users have access to the production data. That sounds okay to me, right? But application programmers do not. Yeah, that sounds good. Users do not have update access for production programs. Users do not have update access for production programs, but application programmers do. Can you understand why that's a bit of a problem? Let's, let's look at B now. Huh? Users have, access, have update access for production data, but application programmers do not. I agree. Now this is different from the part, uh, you know, the, the answer A. Neither users nor application programmers have update access for production programs. Remember I spoke previously that it can be, you know, very tricky that programmers would have access to, you know, pro, uh, production data, especially when it comes to updates? All right, so the, the answer is, is B. Users need to update data through application programs. An important segregation of duties is that the application programmer should not be able to change production programs. They should submit changes to the change control unit and application programmers should never have update access to production data. Users have no need to change production programs. Physical security. Here we're going to look at the different physical security threats that are actually part of information security because you know, not everything is on a network, not everything is uh, you know, purely information. We're going to look at the different threats and I'd like you to you know, spend just a second trying to think about what these different threats are. So I'm going to start with the bottom right and I think it's uh, pretty obvious. Hazards and threats. Obviously fire being a rather important one, but uh, you know, we had gas leak, uh, we had uh, you know, flooding recently. Uh, there can be different hazards and uh, threats that can be problematic. Of course, you know, a little pandemic can uh, you know, really throw a, a wrench in your operations, at least for a given time. Huh? Top left, unauthorized access, theft, and vandalism. Here we're talking about physical security threats. So, you know, this is not a metaphor. The person on the 
top left with his um, crowbar trying to open a door, this you know potentially would be you know an, an access and, and vandalism threat. And so you know one of the controls against this is you know to, to send in you know a penetration tester, a social engineer that is an actual person to your premises to test out whether they can gain access to this. And if you want to have a few examples of this, then um, the Darknet uh, podcast, uh, Darknet Diaries podcast, is an excellent way to learn about plenty of stories about this. Uh, it, it's very interesting. Huh? Uh, on the bottom left, what's happening here with the coffee mug? Okay, I would have preferred if it had been on, a, say, a keyboard or something, but it's, it's simply human errors. Let's, let's understand that most issues that an IT department is going to face, even if they might look like fraud at the beginning, is uh, human errors. Don't assume uh, that people you know, are necessarily malicious. Always just start with the assumption that they're stupid. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm a bit mean here, but you know, d d don't look for maliciousness when human stupidity is a better explanation. And top right, uh, service disruptions. So, you know, our Singapore office not being able to get a proper connection to our, uh, you know, centralized uh, database. But indeed, here I'm kind of showing the physical security threat of, you know, can be a, can be a human error of maybe someone, you know, flipping the wrong switch or something. So what are the controls against this? Okay. So for hazards and disasters, yeah, I'd start with a fire extinguisher. How about fire alarms? maybe disaster recovery tests as well, uh, and flood prevention. So this is a great example of, uh, you know, a big American bank uh, during the, um, you know, floods in New York, which had a very interesting information security tactic, which was, you know, to prevent against the hurricane coming to New York, they simply had sandbags, you know, sandbags. Come on, that's your simplest thing. Protect with sometimes physical means. For unauthorized access, theft, and vandalism, we have, you know, security personnel can, uh, can do wonders. And nowadays we have different types of, you know, access controls. These can exist, you know, cards, uh, you know, your, your little badge to access, but there are even, you know, controls, uh, there, there are even means for hackers to be able to, you know, copy cards at a distance so it's not infallible. And so you have more and more biometric controls. And this might sound futuristic, but for anyone who owns a modern smartphone, this isn't necessarily so. You unlock your iPhone, or at least I do, by showing your, you know, your face to it. And um, even though it only works for me uh, one time on two, maybe I have a strange, to, uh, strange uh, face that uh, it can't analyze very well, uh, biometric controls are something that you know you, you see in the the day to day the day to day and even though you might not think you have them in your organization think do you have for instance you know access to a network by using a code which is sent to your phone your phone which uses you know your your thumb or your face recognition to be able to actually unlock that and so more and more organizations are actually using these biometric, biometric bio as in, you know, biology and metric as in, you know, mean to, means to measure, biometric controls to actually be able to, you know, provide extra security. For service disruptions, you can think about a few, but uh, I gave the example of, you know, having a local server, uh, but also think about electromagnetic interference shielding. Okay. Let me give a little explanation about this, but cosmic rays, cosmic rays are actually a real thing. There have been cases where software have not worked properly because of the way our universe works, sending you know, little uh, rays, and I'm not a physicist, so I'm not going to tell you which ones, uh, which can actually you know, uh, mess with programs, even bank transfers. And so there are ways of shielding, say, servers. In fact, this is a common control that you have to check for in a server room. Shielding servers from interference. You have to shield them from you know, other magnets. Uh, 
less nowadays, but uh, you know, I remember growing up and I was told, don't bring a magnet close to a computer, it can mess it up. And I believe that's still true. Huh? Uh, what is an uninterruptible power supply? Well, it's something that you should check in every single service room. Um, it's something that you should check in every server room that you might be auditing. An uninterruptible power supply indeed you know, it is an extra power generator or a battery which kicks in immediately if there's a cut in the power. And it might only give two hours of power, the best ones uh, give a lot more time than that, but it would be able to kick in given a, a, you know, an interruption in the power supply, and so you'd verify that, you know, to, to avoid service disruptions. And then for human errors, I mean, you, you can have manuals, you can have procedures, but, you know, quite frankly, a lot of people don't read those, or at least not very well in details. So a big warning sign, you know, server room, don't enter, can do wonders as well.